Amen. Well, if you're glad you're in church tonight, say amen. amen. Hey, there's a lot of places where we could be tonight, but I'm glad that I'm in church. Amen. There would be no other place that I'd want to be tonight. In fact, I'm thankful that he is hiding me under his wings. Amen. Boy, that song will mean a lot to you when you're going through a storm in life. Amen. If you would, find your place with me in the Word of God, Acts chapter 26, and stay with me when you find your place. I do thank the pastor for inviting me over to preach. I count it a great honor and privilege that he would consider me to do so. I recognize that what I'm about to do, that no mortal man belongs to do, and it's going to take a help of somebody bigger than myself. Amen. I'm with the pastor. I feel a, a shift in the spirit today. I feel something sweet, like the Lord's getting ready to break through and do Amen. something big. We was just in Spanish church just a moment ago. I was uh, kind of giving a thought in English to the, to the young teens, and I believe that one teenage lady, she ended up trusting on Christ already Amen. today. So that's Amen. two people on this ground. God help us as a church to not just get uh, content and complacent with what the Lord is doing. We need to be thankful and be grateful for when he shows up. Acts chapter number 26. <clears throat> Acts 26, if you find your place, say amen with me. This is a familiar passage of scripture. I'm going to give a background to it and then kind of take a different thought. And hopefully we'll make some decisions tonight that will last a lifetime. The Bible says in verse number 13 of Acts chapter 26, it says, At midday, this is Paul speaking here, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. I could just stop right there and say that I'm thankful for the day that Jesus passed by my way. I'm thankful for the moment in my life when Jesus came by and showed himself in a radiant way such as he shined himself amongst Paul that day there. The Bible says in verse number 14 that when they were all fallen to the earth that Paul he says here I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue Saul, Saul, why persecute thou me. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, O Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet. Praise God that the Savior didn't come to condemn, but he come to change Paul right here. The Bible says, For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, notice that word, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom I send thee to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive, that they may receive the forgiveness of their sins and an inheritance among them which are sanctified by the faith which is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. And look down in verse 24. It says, And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doeth make thee mad. But he said, I'm not mad most noble Festus but speak forth the words of truth and soberness for the king knoweth of the things before whom also I speak freely notice here for I'm persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him for this thing was not done in a corner King Agrippa believest thou the prophets and read this with me I know that thou believest you can be seated would you pray for me tonight and pray that the Lord would speak to yourself our father I recognize Lord that I stand in a place that I don't belong God I'm thankful Lord for the day in my life when you pass by my way like you did Paul. God, I pray, Lord, that you'd bless this dear church. God, I pray that you'd bless their faithfulness, God. Lord, I pray for these teenagers tonight, God, that they'd feel the power of the Holy Ghost, dear God. Lord, I'm so thankful that there's still some teens that want to sing for you. God, I pray that you'd do something big and mighty tonight that only you could do. Father, I promise, Lord, that I'll give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen and Amen. Well, here we are in Acts chapter number 26. Many of you, if you've been in church for any amount of time, you're familiar with this passage of Scripture. Uh, you know the, the, what happens later on in the Scripture where King Agrippa gives his famous statement before Paul. But before we get there, I'd like to dig a little bit and read in the hinder part, in the beginning of the text rather, of what Paul claimed that he was himself. I believe that us not only as young people, but I believe also that us as church members and anybody that's been saved or unsaved can relate to the Apostle Paul. Oftentimes we know him as his name of Paul, but we fail to recognize that before he ever became Paul, he had a moment in a lifetime that he was named Saul. Notice number one with me, if you would, about the Apostle Paul, that he was a 
Pharisee. The Bible says in verse number five, five as he begins to give his, his account before King Agrippa, he said this. He said, I live a Pharisee. Hey, how many of you know what the definition of that word Pharisee is? I've done some studying on it. And listen, I'm a simple-minded person. I'm a teenager like most of you are in here tonight. And I like keeping things short, sweet, and simple. The best definition that I can find for the word Pharisee is someone who is all about the external and not about the internal. Not too long after I read that definition, and stay with me here, I'm building to something. I started thinking about myself. I started pointing it to my, anytime I read scripture and God begins to speak to me, I start reflecting it upon myself. I started thinking about, man, how many times in my life that I was living all about the external and could care less about the internal. If we was to see the Apostle Paul, we'd see a man that was miserable. We'd see a man that was murdering Christians. We'd see a man that just looked like he had it all together, yet he was miserable on the inside. I believe that's most of us in the church today. I believe we got a pharisaical crowd going on. And listen, I know that I'm 19 years old. I've not been in this thing very long at all. And I bless you guys for your faithfulness. But I can speak as a teenager. I watch time and time again. Teens come in and act one way around the pastor and the youth pastor. And they go out around their friends and they want to act another way. And it's not just teenagers. I know that this has a youth emphasis on it. But it's more so that you got church members and even deacons that will come. And they act like it wasn't too long ago. I heard a story about a deacon who had ran off some 76 year old man and he was doing things that he didn't belong doing in the first place can I just say that all of us are guilty in times in our life of living like a Pharisee not only was Paul a Pharisee but notice number two that Paul was a persecutor verse number 11 I believe it is Paul says this he says and I punished them off he was a punisher a persecutor praise God he says down he says and compelled to them blasphemy and being exceedingly mad against them notice here I persecuted them even under strange cities. Paul literally says at the end of verse number 10, he says that whenever Christians went up before the council, he said I gave my voice against them. You know what that means? That Paul was one of the men that was guilty of voting Christians to death. Paul was persecuting the things of God and I find it quite interesting how we got half of a New Testament or, or, or some odd so a number of pages that the Apostle Paul that the Holy Ghost of God has used him and pinned him and used him in great and mighty ways. I'm I'm so thankful for people like the Apostle Paul. I'm glad that we can see in the Word of God that we don't have to live a life like we got it all figured out. But there's times in our life where we can come into church and we can come in broken and we can leave blessed. And listen, teenagers, you might have come in here tonight crippled, but I'm telling you with the help of the Lord and the Holy Ghost of God, you can leave change. The Apostle Paul said here, he said, listen, uh-uh, I wasn't only a Pharisee, but I went as far as to persecute I wonder if we was to draw you up here and we was begin to peel back. You and adults alike how many times this week that you persecuted the word of God that you just took this Bible that we have for granted come on we're all guilty of it how many times you persecuted God in your worship how many times we persecuted God in the way that we walk how many times we persecuted God in the way that we witness literally keeping the gospel away from those around us how about this how many times we persecuted the word of God or the ways of God or the watch the things that we watch or the things that we come on we're all guilty of persecuting the Lord I know before I was saved, and can I just say even after I've saved, persecute literally the definition means to treat ill. You say, Brother Nate, you're 19 years old. You just came up here, you told me that I'm a Pharisee, that I'm all about the external, and I'm about the internal. I don't know how I feel about that. Brother Nate, you just said that I was a persecutor, that I treat ill the things of God and the things around me. Can I just say, honey, that I'm glad that Acts 26 doesn't end where Paul's a Pharisee and Paul's a persecutor, but I read just a a few chapter or a few verses rather after that where the King James Bible it says that Paul that Jesus came by to give him a purpose I'm glad tonight that no matter the life that we lived in the past that Christ can come by and give you purpose listen to me here for a second teenagers you might be living a pharisaical life you might be living a persecuting life you might be punishing people but I'm here to tell you tonight that there's a God in heaven who's got a purpose for you something that the world can't give you something that the things you watch can't give you something that the things you listen to and you worship can't give you there's a God that loves you tonight and he's coming by to give us a purpose hey we got a generation of society of people that just are living complete without purpose they're living a pointless life it bring God more glory than to, to, to honestly can I be honest with you tonight church it's a Sunday night crowd we're most like family in here anyways some of us we're, we're living a life that's so pointless it bring God glory more glory just taking us home that's the truth the fact of the matter but God 
He came by and he gave him a purpose. I want you to notice a few things that God gave him a purpose to do. Number one, a purpose to serve. The Bible literally says in verse 16, he says not too long after he tells him to stand, he says, I'd appear to you for this purpose, to make you a minister. You know what that word minister means? It literally means to serve God. I don't know who this is for tonight, but God did not save you to sit on this church pew. God saved you to serve. You say, how can I serve? Get behind the man of God. Start praying for the man of God. Teenagers, start praying for your youth. Start praying for your school. Start praying for your pastor. Start coming in here and just helping clean up. Everybody's got a place that they can serve. God forbid that we live in this generation, in this society, where we're seeing Christians give in and give up each and every single day. Honey, I didn't come to get out of church. I come to get in on church tonight. I didn't come to get away from the blessings of God. Praise God, I come to get in on the blessings of God. I don't want nothing to do with somebody that's all about their self and not about the Savior. I thank God that he's given me a purpose to serve. Hey, I understand. I feel just as unworthy as you do. But I thank God that for some odd reason, he's dealt with this old sinner boy and given me a purpose to serve. Not only a purpose to serve. This is the intro. A purpose to sacrifice. You see, when Paul got saved, Brother Hazel, he had to get rid of some things. Just as we do each and every single day as Christians. I'm going to tell you three things that Paul got rid of. Number one, he got rid of some partners. Oh, yes, he did. He had to get rid of some of them people that he was running with in Acts chapter number nine. Hey, it wasn't too long after he got saved that he got baptized and he ended up preaching his first sermon. Praise God. I love when it happens like that. Hey, by the way, I just felt led to say this. God forbid that we condemn a teenager or God forbid that we condemn a church member that just comes in and gets saved for the way that they start living and worshiping God. I I'm thankful that old things are passed away and that all things have become new. But I come to tell you tonight that if you want a purpose and you want in on the blessings and the, and the things of God, then you're going to have to sacrifice some things. You're going to have to get rid of some partners. Listen to me, teenagers. There's some friends that you're hanging out with that you have no business being around. Not one time have I ever had to drop a friend. But you know what happens? You start reading your Bible. You start praying. You start worshiping God. You start living for God. You start standing out in that crowd and they don't want nothing to do with you no more I've never had to get rid of a friend but I've had several get rid of me he had a purpose of sacrifice you say what he sacrificed brother Nate he sacrificed his partners number one number two he sacrificed his pride anybody that ever gets saved you have to get rid some of you in here are lost tonight I'm just going to be honest with you there's probably some people that are sitting on this church pew maybe your parents are, are, are involved in the church but you just don't know where you would spend eternity you don't you're living a life you have no clue what you're going to do whenever you get out of the home you know why that is because you haven't gotten the purpose that God's given you God's purpose is way bigger than a secular university God's purpose is way bigger than any sports you could play God's purpose is way bigger than any social media gimmick that you you can find. God's purpose is way bigger than any secular music that you listen to. I'm telling you tonight that God has got a purpose for us, church. I know that this world is full of persecution, but I still believe that God has a purpose for us tonight. Hey, my kids, whenever I go older and have kids, they need to see that God still has purpose. I don't think that, hey, listen, I think that God still wants to use us tonight. He had a purpose to serve. A purpose to sacrifice. He sacrificed partners. He sacrificed pride. And number three, can I just say that I'm thankful that God, whenever he comes and deals with us, he'll let us sacrifice our past. Oh, yes, honey. The apostle Paul had some things that he never would want anyone else to know, just like you do and just like I do. That deepest, darkest thing, maybe even your wives or your husbands don't know about it. Maybe even your girlfriends or your boyfriends. Maybe even your best friends. Maybe even our partners that we go to work with each and every single day. We all got darkness in our lives that we don't want to be brought to light and Paul what he's saying right here is not only did he have to get rid of his past and not only did he have to get rid of partners and pride but whenever God started dealing with him and whenever he got rid of his pride and whenever he got rid of his partners Paul was probably thankful that he could get rid of his past so why do some of you want to hold on to what you got in your past why do we as a church let what happened in the past still condemn us to this day. You don't know why you haven't fulfilled your purpose? Because the stuff you've asked God to forgive you for 10 years ago, you're still letting it creep into your prayer life and Satan condemn you right now. I believe it. I fight that. I'm going to be honest with you. Preacher, you ever go to pray and then Satan will come and put something in your mind that you don't ask to be forgiven for several years ago? You know what that is, honey? That ain't conviction. That's condemnation from this devil, truthfully. But notice here with me. Paul got rid of, listen, are you listening tonight? Say amen if you're still with me. Paul got rid of some things. He got rid of his past, his pride, and his partners. 
And I want you to notice that he didn't only give them a purpose to sacrifice and only a purpose to, to, to serve, but Paul received a sacrifice to stand. Now you're with me. Here we are in Acts 26. Some odd years after God appeared to Paul, Jesus Christ himself, and transformed him, convict him, and showed him that he needed to be a Christian and change and sell out for God. He gave him a purpose. He said, Paul, I want you to be a minister. And he said, I want you to be a witness. And notice, too, he said that I want you to stand. 16, the verse 16 right there literally says this, but rise and stand upon thy feet. You know why Jesus told Paul to rise up and stand? Because he had somewhere for him to go. You know what God wants to do for you tonight? He says you're living in the muck and the miry. This isn't just for young people. There's church folk that we, we go out in it all the time. I get it. I understand. I didn't come to condemn you tonight. I come to challenge you and to push you closer to Jesus Christ himself. Hey, listen, God wants to come by and pick some of you up out of the deep, darkness, dangerous, depravity, depression that you're in and deliver you and dead set you on a new path and give you a new purpose and give you a pardon and give you some promises that he will never leave you. He'll never forsake you, but you're going to have have to stand. I wonder if God come by your way tonight and ask you to stand if you'd stand up and go somewhere for him. I want to notice several things about this word. Stand. You see, I'm preaching on this thought tonight. Stay with me. I'm 10 minutes and 50 seconds in. I'm going to be done just here in just a second. I said all this to say this. We need some people, and this isn't just for young people. We need some church people and young people alike to take a stand in a society that's sitting down. Yet we was talking about it at lunch. There's several churches all across America. It isn't just one single church where it's been revealed those who were standing for Christ before COVID and who wasn't standing for Christ. Who wasn't, who wasn't strong in their faith. Who wasn't sustained and, and like the preacher preached this morning, established in the faith. You know what will happen if you get established in the faith? You'll take a stand for God. Three things that I notice about Paul's stand. Stay with me tonight, teenagers and, and church people. I'm trying to give you something. I, I pray that the Lord will bless you. Notice, number one, if you're going to leave here taking a stand for God, notice a desolation that compassed about him, literally meaning that surrounded him. You say, what are you talking about, Brother Nate? I believe that if we were to bring the Apostle Paul in here right now, sit him right here on this seat, he'd tell us a few things about this place. He'd say, listen, I want y'all to notice, number one, that this was a desolate situation, but it wasn't just desolate. It was dry. None of them, some on hundreds and thousands, Thousands of people that was there didn't want nothing to do with me or the things that I had to say. And whenever I was standing before God, I wasn't there for myself. I was there to brag on Jesus. I didn't have no business being there in the first place. I was just trying to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul would say something like this. He'd say, buddy, it was a dry setting. Hey, listen, I'm thankful that the Bible says that we can come and get a drink from Jesus. I'm glad that out of the, I'm glad that Christ will sustain us, that he'll strengthen us, that he'll put us into the ministry. Hey, some of you are going to have to stand. Listen to me now. You're going to have to stand in some dry situations. I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but our schools are very dry. There's no water of Jesus coming out and flowing in that school. And that doesn't mean that you bow down and that you start worshiping the little G gods that they worship. That means you get a backbone like a saw log every morning. You drink, wake up and drink about a half a gallon of I don't give a rip. You get your Bible in your hand. You say, I'm going to serve God whether they like it or not. You say, bless God, I know it might be dry, but I serve a big God that called me into the, hey, he called me and he saved me. He reached down to where I was and the best thing that I could do, the best gift that we could give God isn't some money, although you ought to tithe. It isn't something, something that you can do and sweep the pot. If the best thing you can give God is your full, total surrender to him and his will. I believe that. That's a bet. Now, all that other stuff is good, praise God. But you, if you're not fully surrendered to God, then you ain't right with God. The most comfortable place that you'll ever be is in the will of God. He'd say it was dry. You're going to have to stand for God at school. What about us? What about us older folk on social media? Hey, listen, I get it. Man, I'm, I'm just the biggest Republican as most of you in here are. But God forbid that we post more about politics than we do about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Come on. I know that might not be good preaching and it might not rub you the right way. But I'm just trying to encourage you because you've got lost friends that are looking at you and you're posting your church clothes. But a few hours later, you're talking about how much you hate this Democratic person. Listen, honey, I don't like them personally myself. But if lost people are seeing that, they're going to say, how in the world would I I want something that they have. I have very strong opinions just as you do. But it's important that we stand for God in our dry settings in life. In school, 
Hey, listen, on social media and our sports scenes, I played football. I was pretty good at it too myself. You know what? I got to go back and I got to preach to my football team last year. I saw 17 kids. I'm not lying to you. 17 kids in one night trust on Christ as their personal Savior. Had to take a stand. He'd say, listen, he'd be a preacher. He'd say it was dry. He'd say, listen, number two, he'd say it was daunting. The Apostle Paul was literally covered with shackles and chains. Hey, listen, in history it's told that as he was brought before this setting, daunting literally means that to deal with with great anticipation. And the Apostle Paul, here he is looking up at King Agrippa. And listen, he's in there and he's anticipating. He can see Agrippa shaking. He can see Agrippa about to crumble. And he's anticipating that Agrippa is going to make a decision for God. I wonder tonight if we were to look in at you. Some of you are looking up here at me and you're like, what in the world is going on? I'm just excited about Jesus. I'm just thankful to be in church. I'm just glad that I got a God that's given me a purpose. Because I know how long I was trying to find it in the world. But I'm thankful tonight that there was a God that passed by my way and gave me a purpose. Not only would he say it was dry and daunting, but it was dangerous. Listen, I'm going somewhere with this. King Agrippa, his great-grandfather was known as one that tried to kill baby Jesus. His grandfather literally beheaded John. You say, what you saying brother nay if anybody knew about Agrippa I believe it'd be the apostle Paul one of the biggest persecutors in the entire word of God and Acts chapter 7 it says that they come and they cast the thing at a young man's feet named Saul Saul was at the stoning of Stephen Paul knew what it was about to persecute Christians and here he is standing for God in a dry setting in a desolate setting and in a dangerous setting I wonder if you're prepared to stand for God and when the world gets worse listen I'm not one of them. I don't always try to be down. I believe that it's a pastor's job to keep us real. But in my position, I just want to encourage you. I think it's going to get better. That might be a wild thought, but I think that God is still big enough. He's still a big enough God that he can use us as Christians. I don't want to write my kids and my grandkids off before they ever take a breath. So why are you doing that tonight, ma'am? Why are you doing that tonight, sir? Don't give up on us young people. We need you in this generation. Us young preachers need you. Hey, listen, us young, us young, I'm 19 myself. These young teenagers, we need you to support us. I understand the world's dark. I understand the world's dangerous. I understand the world's desolate. But what about us that want to take a stand against that this morning, or tonight rather? Hey, listen, notice number one, the desolation, the compass about Paul. You're going to have some desolate times in your life if you take a stand. Number two, and I'm hurrying, the distractions from the crowd. Well, you say, what are you talking about, Brother Nate? Here we are. It says, as he thus spake for himself in verse 24, that Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doeth make thee mad. Here's Paul in the middle of a preaching storm. He's just bragging on the name of Jesus. The only way that he knows how, appear before a king, and here comes Festus speaking up with his big loud mouth and he said "Uh uh-uh can I interrupt you sir no 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 he just went ahead and did it himself he said Paul you're beside yourself in other words can I give it to you in in North Carolina and Statesville slang Paul what are you thinking man he doesn't want nothing to do with what you're talking about you are an idiot you know what this world will tell you you're an idiot for standing for God you know what this world will do it'll distract you from the things that God has for you but notice with me tonight people listen I'm trying to encourage you Paul remain focused through it Paul he hey he said, listen, hey, much learning doeth not make thee mad, most noble Festus. Hey, Paul said down here, he said, I think myself happy king. He said, listen, right here, he said, for the king knoweth these things, but for whom also I freely speak. Oh, you know what you're going to have to do when your friends try to distract you? You know what you're going to have to do whenever the things in this world try to distract you? Honey, you're going to have to stay focused. You're going to have to go to Colossians 3, 2, where the Bible says to set our affection on things above and not on the earth. You're going to have to start applying the scripture where it says that we walk by faith and not by sight. I know I see the wickedness of the world. I see where we are heading, but I still believe that we serve a God that can make impossible things possible. I still believe that we serve a God who can take the Apostle Paul from the where he was named Saul and use him and give him a purpose. I'm just telling you tonight, honey, that you're going to have to stay focused. Hey, listen, not only was Paul focused, but number two, he was faithful. In verse 19, it says, whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. I don't know who needs to hear this tonight but it doesn't matter how you start honey it matters how you finish listen that can go two ways number one you started off life real bad God got a hold of you and now you're going to get to finish and you're going to get to raise up kids and church so on and so forth but some of you maybe you started off red hot for God you couldn't wait to get to church and now your wife or now your husband has to beg you to get to church in the morning young people listen to me you started off red hot for God you got back from a youth camp some preacher got up here and thundered the word of God and you couldn't wait to lift up your hands and praise how you doing now it doesn't matter how you start honey it matters how you finish Hey, the Apostle Paul, we don't know much about when he was Saul, but we know a whole lot when he was Paul. 
Hey, listen, he remained focused. He remained faithful. And number three, he was fearless. Despite the distractions of Festus by making a loud voice, Paul remained unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen, not only do I notice the desolation that compass about him and the distractions from the crowd, but notice with me the decision that was costly. I didn't read this verse for a particular reason. I believe that tonight we're battling spiritual warfare. I believe we got some people in here tonight, young and old, that are going to make decisions that literally cost them a lifetime. Read with me in verse number 27, or 28. It says, King Agrippa said to Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Son, you talk about a costly decision. Imagine being on the brinks. Literally, a, the, Agrippa's whole body was shaken. So close to being a Christian. Yet he's spending an eternity in hell. I wonder how close you are tonight. If the piano player would come. <clears throat> no, Paul, or Agrippa, it didn't only cost him a pardon from, or, 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 or it cost him, number one, a pardon from sin. You see, Agrippa, the time he was almost persuaded, he started thinking about preacher of the past and all the things that he'd done wrong. He started maybe doing something like this. Many people don't know this, but the person that was right beside Agrippa on his right hand was Bernice. Bernice was his wife. Bernice wasn't only, it was his half-sister as well. Agrippa started thinking about, I guarantee, listen to me, young people, you're so close to making a decision for God tonight. You've been so close to giving your life to Christ several times, but you're so worried about the past and what you've got on your right hand tonight. You're so worried about that. It cost him a pardon from sin. Number two, it cost him a peace that would sustain. There's nothing like getting peace from the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, I can't explain how you can be in the middle of a storm and still shout. How you can be in the middle of a storm and still serve. The only way that I can say is we serve a God that is big enough. I heard a preacher say one time, we don't know how we're going to get through things in life because God doesn't give us the grace that we need to get through until we get to the thing that we're going to need the grace. It costs him a part of from sin. It costs him a peace with sustain. That ain't the worst part, young people. It costs him a place with the Savior. Here a group is right here, shaking. On one side, he's got Bernice. On one side, he's got Festus. He's so close to going out and going in for God. He literally said, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Almost. I'm almost there, Paul. Almost. Almost is not enough, teenagers. Listen to me, church. Almost is not going to be enough. You almost serving God tonight, almost ain't going to cut it. You almost telling your friends about Jesus, almost ain't going to cut it. We need some Christians that will be all in instead of almost. Amen. Then we'll see a difference in this generation. I was in, uh, I was in church a while ago and I heard a story of a young boy. He got up and he began to weep and he was just telling just this miraculous story in his life how whenever he was just 10 years old that his, uh, his mom was in an abusive home with his stepdad and his dad was never there. said that he literally almost got killed by his stepdad one night and his mom moved him out of that house and moved him into a drug house and how this young, t uh, young 10 year old boy, how he, how he had to sleep at the door and he began to just have to make sure that his mama wouldn't leave at nighttime. And he said as the story went on, he said, listen, that isn't the worst part of of it, but just a few months after my mom, my mom uh, uh, left that house and we was in a drug house touching heroin, he said, I can remember having to go to school and just put on a fake smile and just make people think that I had it all together, but at home I was going home to drugs and dope. My mom wanted nothing to do with me. She just wanted things to do with all the guys. As this young boy began to tell this story, literally tears started flowing down through people's faces. He said, that ain't the worst part of it. He said, it gets worse, brother. He said, just a couple months after that, my star, or, or my mom I got a call she was in a wreck in Detroit Michigan she broke 63 bones she punctured both of her lungs she ended up having to get her leg amputated uh, from it she she ended up getting addicted to heroin through this process she was in the intensive care unit for some 60 days she had to have people take care of her she had to people attend to her she could never walk again in her life she ended up moving back to our to, to their hometown as this boy began to tell the story tears was just flowing down his eyes and he said my mama moved back to the town and I got so happy Happy. I thought that my mom was going to be in my life. I thought that I was finally getting my mama back only to find out that she was going to choose a drug over her boy, that she was going to choose that same guy over her boy. And my mom, she just began to shoot dope. He said, my mom got $750,000 cash. Listen to me tonight. I'm trying to help you. He said, my mom, she got $750,000 cash. She was spending $1,000 a day. I'm not lying to you. This is what this kid said. He, she was spending $1,000 a day on dope. She was spending $1,000 a day just shooting heroin into 
into her arms. This young boy, he was growing up with his grandparents. This young boy in 2015, he went to his mama's house and he was staying the night with his brother and his mom and his stepfather at the time. time they ended up getting married, the same guy that abused him. And this young man, as he was telling this story, he said, that night I went in the other room to go get a blanket so that I could make me a pilot. And my mama, he said, by the time I got into that other room, my mom made a <gasps> noise and she overdosed right in front of me. My stepdad, he said he went over in there and his stepdad, he was, he was high on drugs. He said, just at the age of around 14 years old, I had to call the ambulance. I had to hold my brother. Here my mom is with her arms locked, her eyes in the back of her head, white stuff foaming out of her mouth. And here I am as a 14 year old having to tell my brother everything's going to be okay while my mom has no breath in her lungs, while just calling out to a God that I didn't even know, just blaming him, saying, why in the world would you do this to me, God? Why have you given me this life, God? Why have you chosen this for me, God? And as this young man began to tell this story, he said, as they got to the hospital, they saved his mom's life. And he said, I'm not kidding you. He said that his mom was mad that they called the ambulance anyways. They shot her with Narcan. They took away the high that she was on and she was ticked off about it. His mom had wrote uh, suicide letters before, bought a gun, made a plan to blow her, blow her brains out, and he found it. This young man, he had a cousin in 2017 who went and got set up on a bad drug deal, who they put him in the back of a car, set him up the wrong way, and ended up shooting him in his chest. He was just 17 years old at the time and drove him five miles down the road, pushed him out of the car for, them, for him to lay there and die. He said, that was my best friend. That was my partner. That was that my pal. At this point, the whole auditorium, they just couldn't even contain themselves. They said, what in the world? How was this man even standing here today? Why is this boy even in church? He said, as it went on, this boy, he stopped playing football. He said, forget about it. He said, I'm just going to go and do drugs. I'm just going to go and drink. I'm going to do it the same way that my parents did it. I'm going to do it the same way that my friends do it. I'm going to do it the same way that my cousins do it. I'm going to try to find some peace in the world. Hey, listen, they tell me that drinking's fun. They tell me that smoking's fun. They tell me that all of this is fun. And listen, this man, young man, before he knew it, he found himself going out there and doing the exact same thing that the people in the world were doing. He went down to Panama City Beach one, uh, one summer break. It was in the month of August, and he began to run from the police. He was getting drunk. He was getting high. He had the girls. He had the fun. Hey, listen, sin's fun. I'll be lying if I tell you it wasn't. This young man, as he's telling the story, I said, man, that'd be, a, hey, listen, a lot of people would love to live that life. Some of you young people, I just feel like to say this, you need to thank God your parents have kept you from that. Hey, listen, and this young man, as he began to tell this story, he said, for some reason, I opened my phone. He said, and I saw a message of my, from my cousin that was murdered and saying, you need to go, you need to grind, keep grinding in football. Literally, for those of you who don't know, keep playing football, keep working it out if you want to begin to play. And this young man, he said, he said, I just instantly wanted to go and play football to please my cousin that was murdered. Before too long, this young man, what he didn't know is whenever he got back, whenever he got back to Kentucky and he got to this football team, he said what was waiting on him, he never imagined. There was a preacher that came with the fellowship of Christian athletes and began to give him the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said, the only reason I'm standing here today is because that church had a burden to come to me. This young man, he was giving his testimony. He said, and when that preacher got there, I noticed something was different about him. He had something in him that I didn't have in myself. He had something, that, a love that he never felt before. This young boy's mama was still gone, going to appear before a five-year sentence. His daddy was in prison for the majority of his life. His grandparents practiced, raised him his entire life practically from the age he was 10 until, until uh, this time in 2017. And here he is with somebody who's coming in saying they love and care about him. He's going home to a grandpa that's a drunk, going home to a grandma that doesn't, doesn't talk to him much, just gives him money when he wants. I had never felt love before, truthfully. He said, and then somebody came to me and told me about a man named Jesus. He said, they invited me to church. I went over there. I just honestly was there to eat. I was just there to eat and shoot basketball and play games. That's all that I wanted to do. I didn't want nothing to do with anything about what they was preaching, but I'd deal with it if that's all it took for me to be able to get, a, get away from home and receive some peace. It was so bad. His city that he grew up in, literally murderers everywhere. Had best friends gone and got murdered. Cousins. This young man in the month of October of 2017 ended up getting saved, calling upon Jesus to save his life. A couple months later, his mama, she ended up going before her trial. There was a persecutor, or a, a, a prosecutor there rather. This prosecutor, she, he got up and he said, listen, we want five years of probation. Those of you that know about the court of law, the prosecutor most of the time gets what they want. This judge just saw it fit to give this, this woman five years in prison. 
five years. Here's this, here's this 16-year-old boy who just got saved, just got some hope, just got some help. He's thinking that his life's going to be perfect from now on out, truthfully. And here his mom is, two months later, getting sentenced to five years in prison. Ain't going to see him graduate. Ain't going to see most of his college years. This young man just got saved. This young man, he said, I'd done the only thing I knew to do. i just trust God like they all said. Kept going to church, read my Bible when I could. Was it the most faithful? But I knew that's all I had. He said, in the month of March, God began to do a work in his heart. He said, the Lord began to call him to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Only people that were saved in his family was those that he brought to church with him, his little brother and his grandparents. He said, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, God called him to preach the gospel. This young man, of course, he answered the call to preach. And not too long after this young man answered the call to preach in the month of March, in the month of April, his mom went before the judge again for shock probation. She ended up miraculously getting out and, and, and ended up coming in this young man's life again. She had now been forced to sober up. She ended up having a come to Jesus moment. This young man, he was preaching to his mama on the phone, doing the only thing that he knew how to do. He said, I was just pouring into her, telling her about a man named Jesus who could take her off a of dope and could give her some hope. And he said, listen, all I did was just try to love on my mom the same way that I got loved on. This young man, he said it was, it was a Sunday morning in the month of April. He was at the altar calling upon the name of God, calling upon the name of Jesus, that same God that saved him and asking for him to save his mama. And he says it wasn't too long after that that his same mama who only had one leg, who he could hear right now the crutches coming up to that altar. This young boy, he got up from that altar he went back and he sat on that church pew. He started looking over at his mama. His mama was bawling her eyes out, crying, smiling, had something that he'd never seen before, barely had teeth in her mouth, had to wear dentures because she was so far gone on dope. Everybody thought that she was gone. This same young man, hey, listen, you know what this young man's name is? His name is Nate White. I am that boy. I saw my mom get hooked on dope and get put on hope. I saw God come by my life when I was living a Pharisee, when I was living a persecuting life, and I saw him come by and give me some purpose and I just want to tell you tonight that there's no telling what God can do with you if you just fully surrender and submit to him and his will for your life. Hey, God didn't just stop at me and my mom and my brother honey. I got to see several friends come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Hey, I've got to see my stepdaddy, the same man who was abusing me. I got to see him walk an aisle and call upon the name that is above every other name. I saw him call upon the name of Jesus. He came in that day broken and crippled and shackled and he left blessed and changed and saved and I want you to know that there's a God in heaven that still can do the impossible I know tonight I know that we're battling warfare and I know it looks ugly church but we're on the winning side now you ask how in the world are you here you're from Louisville Kentucky well let me tell you I ended up just a couple months ago going on Instagram live doing a, a coronavirus Revival. I have a burden for teenagers. Now I'm called to evangelism and I would love one day to travel this country and burn my tires up preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you come from a past like mine, man, you see God move in such a big way, it's hard not to do that truthfully. Just being patient on the Lord to open up doors. I can't wait to do that. But God forbid that I miss my generation while I have a shot. I still believe in you young people. And I'm not better than you, and I'm not bigger than you, but I just want to come by and bump you closer to Jesus tonight. I've done this revival, ended up meeting this beautiful young lady, ended up getting niched up with her parents, ended up coming down here to visit for a revival that they had going on over there in Albemarle, Brother Cody Zorn. Ended up leaving that revival, talking to her daddy who was a pastor. And said, sir, would you mind if we came back down in a couple weeks? Could you take me? Could you take me and tour Carolina Bible College? I'm trying to hurry up. I'm sorry. I said, could you take me and let me tour Carolina? He said, sure, sure, son. I'd love to. We went and we toured Carolina Bible College. Got to get niched up with Pastor Steve Hurt, Brother Brent Carr, Sassy, Thomas Lovell. Saw some good godly people, just what I needed. Some people that would sow into a young man's life. I made the decision, Pastor, it wasn't too much. I believe when God shows you his will, you might as well just go after it. Why, why linger? There was no reason for me to stay in Louisville, truthfully. If I was in Louisville, I wouldn't be here tonight. May 30th, we drove down. Listen to me, I'm going somewhere else. May 30th, we drove down, preacher. 
my best friend's birthday. Moved my stuff into the college, went to a revival. My mom was visiting with Pastor Vaughn and Miss Kim, and they wanted to get to know each other a little bit better because they're just an hour and a half away from I never imagined that I'd be at his church and serving in the way that's going to happen. Just God just crazy blew it open. But when we got here, my stepdad, he stayed back and watched my brother. Now, my stepdad's an older man, 67 years old. My stepdad had a past. He, he'd done drugs. Man, he'd sold methamphetamine. He told me about hundreds of thousands of dollars that he'd made, and I truthfully believe it. Fought in the Vietnam War. Great guy. Ended up getting saved. Praise the Lord. Well, what he saw is when my mom took us down to college, he saw that as a way for him to do some drugs. My stepdad done methamphetamine. He's supposed to be back watching my 15-year-old brother. Here he has got his door locked shut with a dog locked in there smoking meth. My mom, she had a medicine in my line. My mom, she had to get on an emergency flight home. She had no choice. Her boy was there. Can you imagine the pain that's gripping me? My mom going 450 miles away. And, and excuse me, but for this sorry sucker, I'm just going to be honest with you. I love my mom and I'm going to protect her. And my mom's going back. And I, here I am 450 miles away. You talk about the only thing you can do is trust God. My mom, she got back on May 31st. June 1st, it was a Monday, I FaceTimed my mom. We was on the way to Hobby Lobby with Madison and her mom. I FaceTimed my mom, and my mom began to cry. I mean, I'm talking about break my heart here. My mom began to cry. I said, Mama, what's wrong? I just called to talk to the dog. I just, I miss you too, Mama. I assume you're crying because she said, Nathan, she said, Gary left this morning. She said, he hadn't been asleep in four days. She said, he took every single dime that we had in the bank, took the dog and left. My mom can't work. Gary took her money, it was their money, they're married, took it, and he left the house. I ended up getting a call from her at about 5 o'clock. I'd done the only thing I knew to do is pray. I couldn't go kill him. That would have done me no good. If I would have texted him, he would have just took it out of my family. About 5 o'clock, Mama called me. Mama said, I just want you to know that we got the dog back. Gary came back home. Me and Jeremy left. We're going to Grandma's. I said, thank God. You know, amen. 10 o'clock, Mom on me. I'm hyperventilating almost, just in complete shock. She says, Nate, she said, Nathan, Nathan, oh my God. Daniel, which is Gary's son, just went over to the house and found him unresponsive. Here I am, 450 miles away. My mom going through a couple days. Her boy's leaving for college. Our, our, our relationship just got restored. And here she goes. Now, her step, or, or, or her husband doing drugs to later in that day dying. Man, you talk about hurt. I'm 450 miles away. I just want to hold my mom. You know, I believe my stepdad was a saved man, but I, I, I'm going somewhere. Listen to this. But you want to know what killed my stepfather? It wasn't the drugs that he'd done. It wasn't the dope that he put in him. It was the decisions that he made. And I, listen, listen, I'm not talking about the decision to do the drug. I'm talking about how many times the Holy Ghost of God was speaking to his heart. And how many times he said, Gary, you need to serve me more. Gary, you need to sacrifice for me. Gary, you need to go all in for me instead of being almost. And preachers don't preach this much anymore, but God's got some deadlines. And you say no to God one too many times, he'll just go ahead and take you home. That's what happened to my stepfather. I come to tell you that tonight because some of you are making decisions tonight that are going to cost you. Sure, some of it's going to cost you eternity. Some of you, if you don't surrender to God right now, God might take you away from your family. I'm not here to browbeat you husbands, and I'm not here to browbeat you wives. But you might not care. You might be going to heaven. Your wife needs you. Your husband needs you. James 4.14 says this. It says, Whereas ye know what now shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and vanisheth away. I'm telling you tonight, some of you are making decisions that are costly. Some of you have lived a pharisaical life. You live a persecuting life. God came by your way to this night to give you a purpose. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Nobody looking around. This, stand, this, is, between, this, is, this is solely between me, you, and the Lord. I wonder how many of you tonight, nobody looking around, it's just me and you. I wonder how many of you tonight would say, Brother Nate, I heard you preach that message. And I heard you talk about how we can have a purpose in life. Brother Nate, I'm just not sure... Brother Nate, if I have found my purpose yet, I'm just not sure if God has given me a purpose. If, that was, if that's you, would you slip your hand up? I appreciate your honesty. I see them hands. 
I see them hands. Who, who is it? I appreciate it. Young and old, all across the building. I appreciate your honesty tonight. You say, I just don't know my purpose. All right, put your hands down. Now listen to me tonight. I want to ask you a hard question, and I want to confront you with something. How many of you would say tonight that you just don't know if you were to die today that you would spend eternity in heaven? Hold on, hold on. You say, Brother Nate, I'm almost a Christian. I come to church, but I just don't know if I was to die right now that I'd go to heaven. It's not nothing to be ashamed about. This is time for us to get honest so that you can get help. If you don't know where you would spend eternity, would you please slip your hand up? This is just between me and you. This is between, I see that hand. Anyone else tonight? I see that hand. Anybody else? You say, Brother Nate, I'm almost, I'm almost all in for God. I've almost given my life to Christ. If that was you and you can't slip your hand up, would you just look up here at me? If you just don't know where you would spend eternity tonight, if, you just, if you're just not 100% sure that you're saved, young people, if that's you, would you look up here at me? I see you, buddy. I see you. Tonight you can know. Tonight you can know, as we stand all across the building. <clears throat> I wonder if you'd come hit this altar tonight and pray that God would show you his purpose. The altars are open tonight, young and old, all in between. I wonder if you'd just come and do business with God. I wonder if tonight you'd be like the Apostle Paul and you say, it doesn't matter how I was living in the past, I know that God has given me a purpose. Would you come tonight? Get things settled with God. Don't leave here. Hey, listen, you do business alone with God because this world has got nothing good for you. I promise you. Some of, some of us, can I be honest with you? Some of us older church members, we need to come and pray God would use this generation. Us young people, we need your prayers. Don't stop praying for your kids. Please keep praying for us in this generation. I wonder if you'd step out tonight and you'd pray that God would show his way. God would show, come by in a way of a light. As several have already come, I wonder if we'd just flood this altar tonight and just pray that God would just begin to bless this generation and God would do something and show this generation that they have a purpose. I'm going to pray and turn it over to the pastor. <clears throat> would you come tonight? Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for what you've done. God, I pray that your will be done. God, lead this invitation as you see fit. In Jesus' name, amen.